What's up, everybody? It's Make It Make Sense, and I thought we were done with all the exposés, but we're not. Apparently, everybody has some wrongdoing that is coming out. Thank God that people are speaking their truth. We got to talk about it. So like the video as the intro plays, because we got a, we got a hell of a lot to get into today. <laughs> I'm tired. And, and Yo-Yo got me drunk. <laughs> So like the video in the intro, please. <clears throat> make it make sense. Person I follow, um, what is it called? Um, make it make sense. There's a little guy, make it make sense. I make it make sense. Are you being nice tonight? To quote a great media outlet, make that make sense. Okay. Um, shout out to Mr. Make it make sense. Make it make sense. You know what was up. Okay, so I can't show y'all this picture because I don't know if I have clearance, but um, I got to hang out with my mom today. So it was Mama Mim's uh, <laughs> birthday. So we went to brunch. And then right after brunch, um, I got to spend the afternoon with Yo-Yo and Mr. Ray. Super dope people. The shots were flowing. It was a really good time. Um Y'all know Yo-Yo is hip-hop royalty. She is super sweet, super, super nice. So it's been like a weird couple of weeks. It's been weird, but I've had the, a hell of a time. Uh, so I try to go live and take y'all with me on Instagram. Make it make sense now. You could follow me there. But uh, it was uh, definitely a day, and the drinks were flowing. So I have now, it'll be water for the rest of this. My birthday's in January. Um, okay, so y'all. <laughs> this is crazy. Let's start here. I definitely want to start with Diddy um, because he is blowing smoke up our butts. Diddy says, ah, from his attorney, please see statement to be used in its entirety below for Mr. Combs' team. It is important that this is added to your story as an update or ensure that a new story goes up. Just so we're clear, a decision to settle a lawsuit, especially in 2023, is in no way an admission of wrongdoing. Mr. Combs' decision to settle the lawsuit does not in any way undermine his flat-out denial of the claims. He is happy they got a mutual settlement and wishes Ms. Ventura the best. Cassie, have all your cars checked. Make sure your cars, your houses, uh, he does not wish you the best. In my opinion, let me put my banner up. In my opinion, this man does not wish you the best. Look at him. Look at him, y'all. Looking like a fool in Miami. Fo <laughs> he knows he's going to get photo. Uh, shout out to my actual friend, my actual buddy, Sipping the Monty. He says, pansexual playboy, Diddy, <laughs> king of settlements, is seen here posing for the paps. That he called, I'm sure. Looking stressed and distraught in an effort to garner sympathy from fellow celebs and the public alike. Oh no, who's gonna come to my parties now? Boo boo ninja, boo boo effing who? <laughs> so Diddy is over there pretending. Uh, sorry, let me put it up. Diddy's over there pretending to be um uh, <laughs> sad and distraught. You should have thought about that before you were doing what you were doing, sir. That's what you should have been thinking about. Should have been thinking about that before you were doing what you were allegedly doing. Please don't send me no paperwork. Send me nothing, sir. We got uh like 900 in the chat. Definitely hit the uh <laughs> definitely hit the like button. Oh, did he don't want to f off? I'm sure who knows what he's been doing. Maybe he has allegedly sobered up. 
Uh, maybe he has allegedly sobered up. But okay, we got a lot to get into. Uh, I'll be sure we're thinking that this it was about Diddy. Kind of almost something like this. I do agree my expectations about you were driven strictly from my optimistic view of you, hoping your grimy ways would dissipate with age and or the current state of affairs that will eventually expose that you were on the payroll and secretly part of the... Y'all, I'll be... Go ahead and keep on talking, sir. Go ahead and keep on talking because we'll be listening. Um... You not everybody may not know Slim Thug, but um, but uh, I definitely want you guys to hear some of the ignorant things he had to say, uh, because his retribution was swift, y'all. People are not playing about victims coming forward as they should not, uh, as they should not. But this is what Slim Thug had to say: Cosby coming back and getting puffed. I don't believe in it, man. When shit go down, speak on that shit right then or it's out of there. It should be null and void. You shouldn't even have no type of nothing. You should be you shouldn't be able to do shit unless you must let the people know what happened immediately. It should be a time limit on this shit. What happened was there should not be a time limit on it. There should not be a time. I mean, I know Slim Thug, because I like Slim Thug's music, but everybody doesn't know Slim Thug. Um but yeah, Slim Thug is definitely a rapper. Uh, if you don't know music from the South, you may not know him. But uh, I think he was even on a Beyonce. He was he was on Check Up on it from Beyonce. Um, Slim Thug, Bun B, uh, they're big in my head, but I don't know if the world knows them. But either way it goes, uh, this kind of comment can get you canceled, sir. You was trying. You got around them up. Stand up on love shit. This is what happened. I'm gonna tell you what always happened, right? You was with a billionaire with all this bread all this time, and then you went followed your heart to with a trainer. That motherfucker apartment got smiled in the bitch. That lifestyle fell off. Now it's struggle time, the love wearing off, and now you trying to come up with ways to figure out how to get paid. Now, now I'm healed and I can talk about it. I want to expose niggas in my books. You back and getting Bill Cosby. Coming back and getting puffed. I don't believe in that, man. When shit go down, speak on that shit right then or it's out of there. It should be null and void. You shouldn't even have no type of... No. The average person does not even come forward. And if the allegations that Cassie, um, that Cassie made about Diddy were very much true, then she was in fear of her own life. So, Slim, what this is giving is... I don't know your story, but from the way it sounds, it's like you're scared that somebody might come forward from your past because you jumped in a conversation basically to say victims should not have the right to speak at in their own time. Now people are going to be looking at you as if to say, what did you do in your past? Now, I've never heard anybody say anything about Slim, but now the focus will be on you, sir. Nothing. You, should be, you shouldn't be able to do shit. Unless you must let the people know what happened immediately. It should be a time limit on this shit. What happened was all this ex get the fuck out of here, man. I ain't turning on my heroes over these old fake money grabs, man. Straight up like that. And my and let them make that shit go viral. I ain't turning on my heroes over these lame ass money grabs. Straight up like that. You ain't finna turn my heroes into motherfucking all this weird you turn people into trying to get some money. This is why women don't come forward. No, if somebody did something to you, women, come forward. Tell them then, though. You know what I'm saying? Tell them then. Or around that, go tell somebody. In the in in a world where I guess rainbows and butterflies reign supreme. A victim can immediately go to the police. A victim can immediately get a kit done. And then that person can be in jail starting the next day. Okay, Slim. How do you love? Tell your mama. Tell somebody, please. But when you wait now this time, to, and then you sue it, and you ain't go to the police, it sounds suspicious. Bill Cosby is not guilty of all that. They were getting high with him. 
having fun with them, turning up with them. When they went broke, they started trying to do all this extra Get the out of here, man. I ain't turning on my heroes over these old fake money grabs, man. Straight up like that. And my and let them make that shit go viral. I ain't turning You asked for it and you got it. Turning on my heroes over these lame ass money grabs. Straight up like that. You ain't finna turn my heroes into motherfucking all this weird. That was my part. And then he apologized, kind of apologized. Personal pain, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm sorry, we don't agree on everything. I can still take you to Starbucks and buy you a drink, and we can sit down and chop it up. Like, I don't hate nobody. I don't even hate Cass. It was just my opinion. I ain't wanted to go worldwide. I don't do this to you ever asked, be on social media. You asked for it to go viral. Other pages. I just be talking to y'all, my people. Yeah, you know, so, you know what I'm saying? I just, I don't hear every single day. I do this every single day. I just give y'all my opinion. That's it. I don't make that. I'm just speaking from, you know, my, my. What's uh, he about to say? My, What's he about to say? I'm just speaking from experience. Y'all caught that? Did you catch it? I'm just speaking from, uh, uh, my, uh, huh, what, huh, eggs, bean, potato. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what does he say? I got, I got, what is it? What was the uh, Thanksgiving song? I got hey, 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 uh, potatoes. I'm sorry. Uh, seeing life <laughs> and seeing what happens. You know what I'm saying? End of the day, like, but if I said something wrong, like, yeah, say correct me. Say something. Tell me. I'm here. I'm not running from nobody. Like, you know what I'm saying? But I don't agree with a lot of people on a lot of shit. But at the end of the day, we don't got to agree on everything to have a conversation. You name it. I got green. I ain't that small minded. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> So to all, that was my personal opinion. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm sorry. We don't agree on everything. I can still take you to Starbucks and buy. No, we don't want your Starbucks. Uh, K Brack, thank you for being a member for seven months. Slim Thug, say you was at the freak off without saying you was at the freak off. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so y'all, let's move in to um let's move into this lawsuit because we got a lot going on with Russell and we got a lot going on with L.A. Reid. So Russell, some of you guys might know, um, Russell was accused by three different victims before he fled to um, before he fled to Bali. Right. So that's the information that's already out there. I really kind of want you guys to hear the L.A. Reid um, situation before we get into Russell. So we're going to start here with L.A. Reid. Um, because that's more of the newer information. <clears throat> this is the actual complaint, guys. <sighs> Plaintiff Drew Dixon, by and through her undersigned counsel, makes the following allegations against Antonio Marcus L.A. Reed upon personal knowledge as to her own acts and status upon information and belief as to all matters. Drew Dixon is a music producer, entrepreneur, formal general manager for John Legend's record label, former Grammy voter, so she's the reason, y'all, that Nikki don't have a Grammy. <laughs> just playing, just playing. Former senior AR executive and an advisory board member at New York University's Clive David Institute of Record Recorded Music. Over the course of her storied yet interrupted career, Ms. Dixon facilitated the recording of iconic songs such as American Boy, love that song, My Love Is Your Love, Whitney Houston, Maria Maria, Carlos Santos, y'all, all that is money. A Rose Is Still a Rose, Aretha Franklin, Lauryn Hill, I'll be there for you. You're all I need. Method Man and Mary J. Blige, which is one of my absolute favorite songs. One of my absolute favorite songs. Um, <clears throat> Miss Dixon's career was derailed when not one but two of her supervisors assaulted her. After the assault, Miss Dixon showed resilience and used her tenacity and talent to secure another position at Arresta. If you don't know who we're talking about, um, this is Miss Dixon from back in the day. Y'all, not only was she a pretty lady, she was a Harvard Business School graduate. She was a Harvard Business School graduate. The woman has some serious credentials. And she got where she was because she was a strong woman with a clear point of view and a desire to exceed. And according to her, they derailed it. <clears throat> so let me get back to the actual suit. Um, there, Antonio Reed, aware of the first assault at the hands of, of Russell Simmons, 
harassed Miss Dixon and refused to allow her to succeed unless she acquiesced to his demand to be alone and in close proximity to her, where he would create the opportunity to assault her on two separate occasions. So this man allegedly knew that the woman had been allegedly assaulted by Russell Simmons and then proceeded to try to do it himself. Um, when Mr. Reed committed these at assaults, he did not use a knife or a gun. Such weapons were unnecessary because he held full control of Miss Dixon's career and livelihood in his hands. Despite her well-recognized -re ability, her path to success in an industry where women were expected to yield would vanish if she did not maintain compliant and not remain compliant and silent. The proof? Anytime she rebuffed him, some of the world's most renowned talent paid the price of career stalls. The litigation is not only about horrific physical assaults that Ms. Dixon had to endure, but also about the irreparable damage done to the rare and blossoming career of an extraordinary talent described by one industry insider as the female Rick Rubin. This litigation is about the permanent disruption of Ms. Dixon's previously meteoric trajectory, decades of lost earning power, the missed producer points on Kanye West and John Legend, and countless thwarted professional opportunities and suffocated momentum, all of which cost her millions of dollars. Moreover, the world has missed out on the talented, undeveloped artists that Ms. Dixon attempted to promote while trying to avoid Reed's abuse. Parties, jurisdiction, and venue. Plaintiff Drew Dixon is domiciled in New York. Defendant Antonio Marcus L.A. Reed is domiciled in L.A. The amount in the contrary is in this action exceeds the sum or value of $75,000, excluding interest and cost, and is between citizens of different states. The court has personal jurisdiction over this matter of abuse by Mr. Reed, and the abuse occurred in New York. Huh. This action has been timely filed under New York's recently passed Adult Survivors Act which beginning on November 24, 2022, created a one-year look-back window for the survivors of assault that occurred when they were over the age of 18, allowing them to sue their abusers regardless of when the abuse occurred, which we all, you know, are very well acquainted with through Cassie's lawsuit of Diddy. The actions described here constitute offenses by Mr. Reed under New York penal law. Ms. Dixon, when she was over the age of 18 years old, the events giving rise to the to these causes of action occurred in the Southern District of New York, where Mr. Reed assaulted Ms. Dixon. Ms. Dixon, the youngest child of Sharon Pratt and Arrington Dixon, had an impressive ear at an early age. As a young child growing up in Washington, D.C., she studied violin and piano, and she loved listening to her great-grandmother, Hazel Pratt, playing the piano. Ms. Pratt would flow easily from gospel to show tunes on the piano, and Ms. Dixon would lie on her bed and soak up every note from the baby grand piano. As a teenager, Ms. Dixon's affinity for recorded music emerged, and she began to create electric mixtapes on her mom's stereo system. Ms. Dixon became fixated on precisely sequencing and songs in order to establish the perfect flow. The crazy part was when I read this, she didn't even talk about Harvard. She didn't need to. She painstakingly created transitions and began to study the liner notes and credits on the backs of albums in her mom's record collection and her own. Ms. Dixon became increasingly interested in the roles of the album covers described. Engineer, mixer, producer, arranger, background vocals, session players. She rummaged through her mother's albums to find lesser known tracks by artists like Earth, Wind & Fire, Parliament, Funkadelic, Luther Vandross, Anita Baker, Stevie Wonder, Billie Holiday, etc. She loved to mix those songs with music by her favorite artists like The Smiths, The Beatles, The Doors. What she's doing is setting the tone that music was really in her blood. She was self-taught in a lot of these things. She was in the Russell Simmons documentary. The new information is the information about um, L.A. Reid. Now, really quickly, we have over 2,200 in the chat. Definitely hit the like button. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe. We're actually like, I think we have less than 1,000 people to 80,000. Um, so the straight shooters are definitely a growing family. So subscribe if you have not. And please hit the like button. It's a free way to support the channel. Ms. Dixon, okay, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Um, as they say in the music industry, before she even knew it, Drew, Dix Drew Dixon had great ears. Ms. Dixon graduated from the National Creed Cathedral High School for Girls in D.C. to attend Stanford University. At Stanford, she made it, majored in history, but on weekends, she made her way to Oakland and San Francisco to check out Bay Area's burgeoning music scene. After Stanford, Ms. Dixon worked an internship at Jive Records and then an in internship at Warner Brothers. We're going to just skip a little bit. <clears throat> Um, 
She landed her first job as junior executive at Zamba Music Publishing in New York City, where she signed the now legendary rapper Nas and hip hop producer Eric Sermon to publishing deals. In that capacity, Ms. Dixon met Mr. Reed for the first time in 93 when she attended the mastering session for the debut album from a band and production team she had heard on the sampler tape and hoped to sign. The band was outcast, y'all. Like, this is what she signed outcast. She signed Nas. Like, <sighs> and the production outfit was organized noise. Mr. Reed indicated how impressed he was that Dixon, a young publishing executive in New York, was aware of Atlanta's outcast organized noise, let alone already positioning herself to secure a deal. Before she was able to pursue her interest in publishing deal for Organized Noise, Ms. Dixon was offered a job at Def Jam Recordings as director of a &R. She left at the chance. While Def Jam, Ms. Dixon was worked with a prominent artist like Montel Jordan and Method Man. Ms. Dixon was also inspired by a cappella interlude that she heard while typing the credits for Method Man's debut album that she urged her boss, Russell Simmons, to let her explore an idea to transform the a cappella vocal into a duet with Mary J. Blige. Are y'all hearing that? This lady heard something in Method Man's catalog and decided you need to do something different with this and include Mary J. Blige. That is a ear for music because um, You're All I Need is, I think, timeless. And I think that's one of the songs for Mary J. Blige and Russell, I mean, and um, Method Man that they will always go down in history for. So, you know, her credits. It was important that we read that. Um, so she started by convincing Puff Daddy to secure Mary J. Blige vocals. And then she coordinated Puff Daddy's production of the song, along with the razor sharp remix by legendary Wu-Tang Clan producer RZA. Excuse me. Booking the studios and equipment for the sessions. Hand delivering the reels each day to both Puff Daddy at the Hit Factory, where he was working on the track, and Chung King Studios, where RZA was producing the mix. During this time, Ms. Dixon was overseeing the production of the show, the soundtrack. She called her favorite artists in her attempt to represent a wide range of hip-hop genres and styles and secured tracks from artists like Tupac, Bone thugs and harmony and the Notorious B.I.G. Just as she had done as a teenager with her mixtapes, Ms. Dixon painstakingly sequenced the album and even chose interludes from the film that she inter interpersed, interspersed throughout. Ms. Dixon's work on the show, the soundtrack, earned her an executive producer credit, sold a million copies, and debuted at number one on the Billboard R&B album chart. At Def Jam, Ms. Dixon also signed dancehall artists like Capleton and Cali Ranks, inspiring the creation of Def Jam Jamaica imprint. She oversaw the recording of the Wings of the Morning remix by Capleton featuring Met the Man, the recording of a duet called The Perfect Match by Kylie Records featuring Lauryn Hill, and the Puff Daddy remix of This Is How We Do It by Montel Jordan. At the height of her success at Def Jam in 1995, and as the show The Soundtrack sat at the top of the Billboard R&B chart, Russell Simmons brutally, I can't say that word for YouTube purposes, but he brutally took advantage of Miss Dixon forcing her abrupt departure from the job she had worked so hard to get. After reeling for several months following the assault by Mr. Simmons, Ms. Dixon picked herself back up and accepted a job as a senior director of a &R at Arista. A few years later, Arista founder and president, the legendary Clive Davis, re recognized her talent and promoted her to vice president of a &R of Arista. Y'all, um... I guess I should have done this earlier. Definitely, this will be a trigger warning. It's not, if these kind of things, you know, impact you, definitely this is not the show for you. I, I should have said it at the beginning. Um, this is, it's hurtful. It's deep. I'm just really glad that these people are coming forward. Um, Weird Gal Weirder says, Jay-Z is a Harvard Business School graduate as well. I didn't know that. I know Tyra Banks went. I had no idea, but um Kudos to these people for going back, continuing the education in such a big way. Uh, right. Somebody says she was around a lot of sickos. Thank you for the super chat. Ms. Dixon was prolific at Arista. Over the course of her career at Arista, Ms. Dixon tapped into her network from hip hop music industry and signed artists like Q-Tip, A Tribe Called Quest, Brand Nubian, Dime, Andrea Martin, Edis Wish, and Toyer. Her most significant contribution came in her ability to identify hit song like My Love Is Your Love, 
which was given to her by Wycliffe from the Fugees from, for Whitney Houston, and Maria Maria also given to her by Wycliffe for Carlos Santos. Lauren Hill of the Fugees gave her a Rose is Still a Rose for Aretha Franklin. Montel Jordan played her two songs, Nobody's Supposed to Be Here and We Can't Be Friends, which became hits for Deborah Cox. Like the biggest hits for Deborah Cox. In addition to those songs, Miss Dixon worked with Whitney Houston on Heartbreak Hotel, which I love, and It's Not Right But It's Okay. Again, another track that I love. And received A&R credits for both songs as well as for My Love Is Your Love album. Miss Dixon also worked on Angel of Mine and The Boy Is Mine for Monica. This lady is very impressive, y'all. Uh, yeah, definitely hit the like button. We have uh, close to 2,700 people in here. We should be at our brown 1,500 likes. Just saying. Um. Ms. Dixon was involved in every aspect of the album recording process, from working with the artists, picking the tracks, coordinating the recording sessions, planning and managing the budgets, and ensuring on-time delivery and the technical integrity of the recordings. She worked closely with the lawyers and business affairs to close artists and producer deals, to secure features from artists on other labels, and to clear samples. She also coordinated with marketing, promotions, publicity, and production departments once the music was complete to help ensure the successful launch of artist albums and singles. As part of her deal at Arista, Ms. Dixon was guaranteed a royalty point on any new artist that she signed. When Ms. Dixon initially started at Arista in 96, she signed a five-year deal to join the A&R department. She reported directly to Clive Davis and worked closely with Arista general manager and executive producer Roy Lott. Her working relationship with Mr. Davis Lott, the legal team, the other A&R executives, and the overall staff at Arista was professional and mutually respectful. Ms. Dixon, so she's basically just setting the scene. This lady knows that she has a hell of a resume and she could only go up from there. She was already somewhat derailed by Russell Simmons and then bam, was like, I'm going to show up and show out at this new label. And that's exactly what she did. Uh, Ms. Dixon garnered the admiration of her colleagues at Arista and throughout the industry. Mr. Lott has described Ms. Dixon as a multifaceted, multifaceted talent in that she not only is able to advise on albums in her known genre of hip-hop, but her opinion was valued on projects and genres, including pop and country. In her role reporting to Mr. Davis, first as senior director of A&R and later as vice president of A&R, Ms. Dixon also interacted with Mr. Reed, whose Atlanta-based label of Face Records was a joint venture with Arista. In all of her interactions with Mr. Reed, the rapport was professional, creative, productive, and mutually respectful, just as it had been since their first meeting at the Outcast Mastering Session in 93. Mr. Reed often invited Ms. Dixon to the mastering sessions for his artists so he could get her take on the new music. In all of the years that Ms. Dixon attended the mastering sessions with Mr. Reed, while he was still running LaFace and while she was still reporting to Mr. Davis, Mr. Reed was professional and respectful. On one occasion, Ms. Dixon sat in the mastering of the fan mail album by LaFace Records superstars, TLC. Ms. Dixon argued strongly in favor of changing the first single to No Scrubs. So what was supposed to be the first single if it was not No Scrubs? No Scrubs is notably one of the biggest songs of what? The 90s, 2000s, 2010, two, that song was everywhere. <sighs> Shortly before she started reporting to Mr. Reed, he acknowledged Ms. Dixon's role in helping him to make the right choice, further bolstering Ms. Dixon's confidence that Mr. Reed's interest in working with her was based on his respect for her exceptional ear as an A&R executive and music producer. Upon learning that Mr. Reed would replace Mr. Davis as her boss, Ms. Dixon was torn. Staying was highly encouraged by the CEO of Arista's parent company, BMG. Strauss Zelnick, who called Ms. Dixon several times during Mr. Reed's takeover, urging Ms. Dixon not to join Clive Davis, Clive Davis at J Records. And before the change, Dixon had contemplated starting her own label when her Arista deal expired at the end of 18 months. If Ms. Dixon had joined J Records, she would have had to sign a new five-year contract. Her decision had been further complicated by a recent cancer diagnosis and surgery to remove one kidney. So she's doing all this at the top of her professional game, She's already experienced one assault, allegedly, at the hands of Russell Simmons. Now everything is changing. Clive is moving to J Records, so she's torn as to what she wants to do. L.A. Reid is about to be her new boss if she doesn't move. And she, cancer. Like, what more can a person go through? 
Although her initial decision had been to join J Records, she did not want to make such a long-term commitment, having just confronted her own mor mortality. So she decided to stay at Arista and report to Mr. Reed for the remaining 18 months in her deal. She had no reason to believe that the nature of her relationship with Mr. Reed, dating back to their first meeting at the Outcast Mastering Session seven years earlier, would take such an awful turn as her career was in his hands. Thus, when Arista came under Mr. Reed's direction, Ms. Dixon declined to go to J Records with Mr. Davis. She also turned down an offer to work for Roy Lott, who had previously offered her a job to be an executive at Capitol and then later at Virgin Records. Ms. Dixon decided to stay put at Arista and chart her course in the music industry in a more entrepreneurial light. She set up an LLC called Possum Records and laid the groundwork for the next chapter of her career that would never come to pass. L.A. Reed. L.A. Reed is a Grammy Award winning record executive who is known for signing hit makers. Mr. Reed started his music career as a drummer in a funk rock band, but he found mainstream success as a member of R&B band called The Deal alongside Babyface. After the band disbanded, Mr. Reed and Babyface founded LaFace Records with funding from Clive Davis as a joint vendor with the rest of records. Y'all know LaFace was stealing everybody's money. Uh, TLC made no money. Tony Braxton went broke. Kind of similar to um, everybody who was with Bad Boy. Y'all seeing these connections? Are y'all seeing these connections? The only people making money were the, the heads of the labels. Um, you know, are y'all seeing, are you guys seeing the connection? <laughs> well, I mean, look, look, I, I will leave it at that. Cause I can see what you guys are saying in the comments. We'll leave it at that. Anyway, <laughs> uh, in 2000, the face. I'm sorry, the label quickly became synonymous with hit records and chart topping success, developing acts like Usher, Tony Braxton, TLC, Pink, Outkast, Avril Lavigne, Rihanna, and Mariah Carey at its height. In 2000, LaFace merged into Arista Records, and Mr. Reeves succeeded Clive Davis as president and CEO and continued to run the firm with much financial success. In 2004, Sony and Arista's parent company, BMG, merged and released Mr. Reed from his contract at Arista. After Arista, Mr. Reed is credited with the musical comebacks of both Jennifer Lopez and Mariah Carey, and he played a role in the success of Rihanna, Justin Bieber, Bon Jovi, and Kanye West. Mr. Reed is also a successful songwriter with credits included Don't Be Cruel by Bobby Brown, I'm Your Baby Tonight by Whitney Houston, Into the Road by Boys to the Men, and We Belong Together by Mariah Carey. In 2011, Mr. Reed served as a judge on X Factor. Also in 2011, Mr. Reed became the CEO of Epic Records. Four of Epic's artists debuted number one albums under his direction. Future, DJ Khaled, Travis Scott, A Tribe Called Quest, with Future releasing back-to-back -back number one albums. In 2016, Mr. Reed published New York Times bestselling Sing to Me, blah, 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 blah. Now, y'all, word on the curve is these were not his first allegations. And when he was released from being president of the company, it was about other allegations coming from one of his assistants. So, um, but let's continue with this. In 2017, following an accusation of misconduct by an assistant at Epic Records, Mr. Reed abruptly exited the record label and expanded his Hitco publishing company and Hitco Entertainment in 2018. In 2022, Hitco sold his assets and recording contracts to Concord Music Group. So there was another allegation. In 2020, Mr. Reed sold 100% of his public publishing interest and writer's share of income for his catalog of 162 songs to Hypnosis and joined their board. Although the particulars of the sale are known, Hypnosis reported spending $1 billion on acquisitions over a two-year period, during which Hypnosis acquired Mr. Reed's music catalog. Early this year, Mr. Reed united with Usher to work on a new album to release through a music company called Gamma. Gamma has raised a billion in funding from Apple, among other investors. And according to media reports, Mr. Reed has an undisclosed ownership stake in the company. An industry mogul, Mr. Reed network net worth is estimated between three to five hundred million. Take it all. You could take it all. Just go ahead and sign it over. <laughs> go ahead and sign it over. Um. Now, let me find out who Drew Dixon is. Well, I kind of told you guys who Drew Dixon is, but um, here's a picture of Drew. Very pretty lady, uh, but okay. 
<sighs> oh, we got like 2,800 in the chat. One of my mods put where we are on likes for me, please. Okay. Mr. Reed's Assault. Uh, exploitation and the power imbalance between women and men are per pervasive in the culture of hip hop and the music industry. Mr. Reed has historically leveraged his position as a gatekeeper in the industry that thrives on exploitation of women trying to break into the entertainment and business. Women in the industry are falsely promised opportunities and advancement by experienced and well-established powerful men in positions to derail the careers of women who reject their advantage or report the assault. Almost immediately upon his arrival at Arista in 2000, Mr. Reed began, began sexualizing and harassing Ms. Dixon. Now, y'all, Mr. Reed, I'm telling you, that's Mr. Reed had gotten married in 2000 to his second wife in, I want to say, Capri. That was also where Diddy allegedly um, cornered and got with Shakir Stewart, who had allegedly had some type of interaction with Diddy's um, baby mama, Kim Porter. So you are having a wedding with your second wife while allegedly hitting on this a &R rep, who is now your employee. Before he even officially started working, Mr. Reed asked Ms. Dixon to join him and his new wife, Erica, with whom Ms. Dixon had been friendly at various industry events to look at new apartments for their move to it, from Atlanta to New York. Ms. Dixon felt it was an odd request, but thought perhaps he was planning to use his home as an extension of his office, so he agreed. After Ms. Dixon arrived with the realtor to look at the first apartment with the Reeds, she realized that Mr. Reed's wife would not be joining at all. During the entire afternoon of showings, Mr. Reed made flirtatious comments. It was so pervasive that it caused the realer, realtor to comment to Ms. Dixon privately that he was left with the impression that Mr. Reed was in love with her. So now we have a witness. Now we have a witness, y'all. No, he's never been openly gay. Um, neither has Diddy or, you know, I'm not... <laughs> He's never been opening. He was married to Pebbles first. And then um, a lady who actually kind of looks like Drew. Let me, L.A. Reed, second wife. Let me show you guys. Um, her name is Erica. But she doesn't look too much different than... I mean, she looks different. I'm not saying she's, I'm saying she has similar features to the woman who he was actually, you know, hitting on and sexualizing. So let me go back to this. <clears throat> in January 2000, Arista held a company wide retreat in Puerto Rico. Arista handled the travel and hotel fees associated with the trip, and everything originated in New York. Karen Kwok, the then VP of a &R administration, told Ms. Dixon at the last minute not to book her own flight because Reed had invited a group of senior executives to join him on a private plane flying from Teterboro Airport so that they could go over all the presentations one last time before sharing new music with the entire company at the retreat. Ms. Dixon was confused when she boarded the plane to find Mr. Reed all alone. So again, now we have another witness and we have logs. She can go back to the actual log. She can go to the assistant who booked the travel and she can go to the airport and pull up the logs of whoever was on that plane. You have a whole private jet for two people. And I'm sure it was on the company's dime too. Um, she, uh, he began flirting with her right away. She went to the bathroom on the plane and tried to buy time waiting for other executives to arrive. Eventually, she came out of the restroom and discovered she was still alone in the cabinet with Mr. Reed. He asked her to sit next to him to go over materials for the presentation, and then he began playing with her hair, kissing her, and digitally penetrated her without her consent. Ms. Dixon spent the rest of the flight in a daze. Although all executives who were vice presidents and above were entitled to their own room at the hotel, Ms. Dixon decided to share a room with her assistant to avoid any possibility that Mr. Reed might try to find her another way to be alone with her during the retreat. 
Throughout their time in Puerto Rico, Ms. Dixon stayed close to her assistant, so she would not be caught alone with Mr. Reed. Now we have another witness, because what sense would it make for an executive to be staying with their assistant? At one point, Mr. Reed complained that Ms. Dixon and her assistant were attached at the hip, but Ms. Dixon struck, stuck with her strategy, which worked while she was in Puerto Rico. Ms. Dixon flew back from the retreat on a commercial flight. Once back in New York, Ms. Dixon continued to avoid being alone with Mr. Reed. After Ms. Dixon learned Mr. Reed's patterns and characteristics, she used that information to avoid him while still trying to be cordial and do her job. She attempted to dodge his overtures without offending and upsetting him. Ms. Dixon's reputation at Arista under Clive Davis was stellar. She only had a few months left in her contract. She knew well the pitfalls of resigning and rebuilding. Ms. Dixon tried to just do her job. Though she tried to navigate the treacherous balance between maintaining a working relationship without succumbing to Mr. Reed's advances, Ms. Dixon was unsuccessful at keeping Mr. Reed happy. Mr. Reed retaliated against her by embarrassing her on the front of others or otherwise being curt and unprofessional. Ms. Dixon began to plan her escape, but unfortunately not before Mr. Reed would assault her again. One evening, several months later, in 2001, after a work event in New York City, Mr. Reed insisted that Ms. Dixon join him for a ride to drop her at home so they could continue to discuss work and he could listen to some of the music she had been waiting for him to review, including a demo of promising young singer Alice Smith. It was commonplace in the urban music industry to listen to music on car stereos, which gave a different sound and experience than listening to music in a studio or even great speakers in the office. Mr. Reed also pr prided himself on the custom state-of-the-art sound system he had installed in his car. Since it was not a very long ride, Ms. Dixon knew Mr. Reed's driver would be present. She agreed. She also knew that if she continued to avoid Mr. Reed, she would never be able to get anything approved for her artist. She assumed it would be safe to accept the ride and continue the conversation with the driver present. She was wrong. Shortly into the ride, Mr. Reed again, without Dixon's permission or consent, began to grope and kiss Ms. Dixon, who squirmed and pushed him away as Mr. Reed's driver stared straight ahead. So now we have another witness. When Mr. Reed complained and became visibly irritated with her lack of compliance, Ms. Dixon froze. Mr. Reed again digitally penetrated Ms. Dixon's without her consent. So I guess that's his thing. Once the car stopped in front of her residence, Ms. Dixon jumped out of the car while taking care not to anger Mr. Reed because by this time she felt trapped. As soon as she was alone in her building, she cried. After this assault, Ms. Dixon intensified her efforts to avoid Mr. Reed. She knew that the repercussions at the time of saying that she was the victim of an assault at the hands of another mogul would be career ending. The blame would lie at her feet. She only told her life coach, another witness. Ms. Dixon began seeing a life coach a few years into her career at Aresta while she was still working for Clive Davis. Dixon continued to meet with the life coach on a weekly basis through the end of her tenure with Reed. Ms. Dixon only told her about the assaults and harassment. I, I'm glad that she had someone to talk to because I can't imagine what it was like to get to the heights of your career and then have people who technically you have put money in their pocket then choose to take advantage of you and basically try to make you feel smaller. So on one hand, you have Clive Davis raising her up. And another hand, you have this jackass literally taking advantage of her, setting up scenarios so that he could take advantage of her and then not actually allowing her to thrive in her job because she really was not interested in his advances. Um, Kaylin 917 said, love you, Mims, is pronounced air, oh, air ista, not arista. Air is the, I'll try to remember that. Thank you. Y'all know I can butcher some words. Um, Y'all know I can butcher some words. <laughs> um, where, where were we? Throughout the time they worked together, Mr. Reed had a pattern and Ms. Dixon tried to navigate around it. For instance, Mr. Reed would instruct executives to advise Ms. Dixon to wear skirts and high heels. Now you have more witnesses. Why would anybody think that it's okay to tell an employee that they have to wear skirts? As a result of the harassment and 
assaulted behavior, Miss Dixon started wearing jeans and Birkenstock clogs, which she knew Mr. Reed hated. She thought these clothing choices would make it less likely that Mr. Reed would assault her, even if she was sitting close to him. Mr. Reed began to invite Miss Dixon to meetings in his hotel room. Night after night, he asked her to come to his hotel room to listen to music, and she told him she would be working in the studio until very late. He told her that no matter how late it was, when she finished in the state-of-the-art studio, she should call him and come over to his hotel room at the Four Seasons to listen to music. She never did. So he started calling her late at night. The first few times she answered and said she would call him back. He would get angry the next morning in the office when she would not follow through. She told him she was tired and forgot. He told her not to forget next time. Eventually, she started letting his late night phone calls go straight to voicemail, and he became angrier and angrier. It was like a cold war. He turned hostile towards her and her artist and her ideas. It was a drastic reversal from Mr. Reed's enthusiasm about her creative taste and instincts over the years. And harm came from the fact that Mr. Reed would directly respond to Miss Dixon's rejections of his advances by punishing the artist Miss Dixon had already signed or by blocking the artist she attempted to sign. Promotional and recording budgets were suddenly reduced dramatically or frozen altogether. Song demos and artist auditions were flatly rejected. Miss Dixon could not do her job at Arista, and she became increasingly concerned that her stiff, her stifled success at Arista Am I still saying it wrong? Let me go back to this super chat so I can try to pronounce it right. Arista. Arista. Okay. <laughs> um, Ms. Dixon could not do her job at Arista, and she became increasingly concerned that her stifled success at Arista, Arista would impede the, her ability to secure a similar job at another label. When Ms. Dixon, because you really are only as good as your last song, I would assume, in the industry or your last album or the last artist you broke. So if she's not getting a budget and she's not able to do her job to the best of her ability, she's scared that if she quits and she goes somewhere else, they're going to be like, well, who have you done recently? That sucks. <clears throat> when Miss Dixon and another colleague in the A&R department brought Kanye West in for an audition, Mr. Reed passed on the rapper and then proceeded to berate Miss Dixon in front of the whole A&R department about how bad she was at her job and what a waste of his time the audition had been, all while Kanye waited in the lobby. No, Kanye today isn't Kanye back then. Kanye back then was um Kanye back then was a money maker. So he was he was dumb, he was a dummy. When Miss Dixon and um blah blah blah. A few months later, Miss Dixon played Mr. Reed the demo for John Legend, then John Stevens, before he got in before he was an EGOT winner. Mr. Reed blew off the demo. So Ms. Dixon invited Mr. Reed to join her watch John perform at SOBs. Mr. Reed agreed to come and offered Ms. Dixon a ride. At the last minute, Ms. Dixon told Mr. Reed she would have to meet him there. Mr. Reed was a no-show. So Ms. Dixon sat at the table near the stage at SOBs and watched John perform with an empty chair by her side. Ms. Dixon was so impressed by John's performance that she brought it up again with Mr. Reed at the next a &R meeting. She played the demo, and at this time, Mr. Reed listened. He was impressed enough by the material that he agreed to pay for John to audition in a private rehearsal space. With Mr. Reed's approval, Ms. Dixon booked a performance space at SIR Rehearsal Studios and invited the senior staff. In the meantime, Mr. Reed resumed his request that Dixon come to his hotel room to listen to music. Again, keep in mind, this man is a newlywed. Again, Ms. Dixon avoided Mr. Reed, so on the day of John's audition, Mr. Reed canceled and told the entire senior staff not to go. Since it was too late to cancel the performance, John and his band performed, and again, Ms. Dixon sat in the front row and watched John's show, this time next to a row of empty chairs, unable to offer John a deal or even an explanation. So you were messing with your own bag just because she turned down your advances. Who is Ms. Dixon? Ms. Dixon is the woman who has come forward with allegations of Russell Simmons and L.A. Reid. <clears throat> if you're just coming in, definitely hit that like button. Um, this is one of those that my mind was blown. I had no idea all this was going on. Um, she know not to come around me. What is that? She know not to come around. I just got here. They will each have their day. So many predators. No, I, I know what digits are. I know I know what I know what digits are. <laughs> um 
Once she realized that Mr. Reed would continue to stifle her career and the prospects of any of the artists she brought to him and that he would continue to undermine the artists she had already signed like Toya in order to punish Miss Dixon for rejecting, for rejecting his pressures, Miss Dixon gave up not only on Arista, but on her dream of starting a label. She left. Oh, I'm still pronouncing it wrong. She left to pursue an MBA at Harvard Business School in 2002. Resigned to the fact that she would never be able to function in the music industry without being sexualized. In 2004, after she graduated from Harvard with honors, Ms. Dixon would try again. She came back to the music industry, but under different circumstances and leadership. She joined John Legend as general manager at Homeschool Records. There, she worked with John to co-executive produce Estelle's U.S. debut album, Shine. She was involved in every aspect of the song selection, recording, mixing, and mastering. She also suggested Kanye West as a feature on American Boy and arranged for him to record his vocals at Platinum Sound. Ms. Dixon worked closely with the Atlantic Records staff on the marketing and promotional aspects release of American Boy. <sighs> um, blah, blah, blah. To ensure Stell's successful launch as a global star. The resulting duet went on to win a Grammy. Unfortunately, by the time American Boy won a Grammy, Ms. Dixon had already left the business. When Estelle's album project moved from the recording stage into the marketing promotions phase, Ms. Dixon had to shift her time from the recording studio to the record company itself. Many of the top label executives at Atlantic happened to be her former colleagues at Def Jam, who were all close friends of both Russell Simmons and L.A. Reid. At industry events with Estelle, Ms. Dixon ran into Mr. Reid and his enablers on several occasions. The consistent reminders of her humiliating experience with Mr. Reed triggered depression and drove Ms. Dixon away from the music again. She found it unbearable to attend industry events that were necessary to promote and market the incredible album that she worked so hard on Estelle, worked so hard on with Estelle and John because she often encountered Mr. Reed or Mr. Simmons or their enablers and needed to be friendly and sociable. Ever resilient, Ms. Dixon then channeled her desire to make music by writing and recording original music of her own. When she shared some of her early songs with her friend Lauren Hill, Ms. Hill was impressed and encouraged her to stick with it. It occurred to Ms. Dixon that she might be able to reenter the industry as a songwriter and producer, which would allow her to return to making records, but instead of dealing with gatekeepers and office politics, she could spend her time in, in her favorite place to work, the recording studio. In addition to the positive response from Lauren Hill, Kanye West also loved Ms. Dixon's music. He liked one of her comp compositions so much that he told her it had become the most played song on his iPod a month after their meeting. Encouraged by that feedback, Ms. Dixon scheduled a meeting to drop off a CD of songs with Mr. Reed, who was at the time the president of Island Def Jam. She still had not worked through the, the abuse she had experienced in the music industry, so she blamed herself for not having thick enough skin to deflect Mr. Reed's advantage, advances without allowing it to derail her. Realizing she could not avoid him completely, even in this new dimension of songwriting and production, she asked one of her producers of her songs to join her at the meeting. As a married woman and a mom, she thought she might be able to interact with Mr. Reed as a peer long enough to play him a few songs and perhaps place one of them with a few artists on his label. However, immediately upon seeing him in person for the first time in years, she regretted her decision. It was still painful to interact with him in any way, and it was no mistake, sorry, and it was a mistake to think that she could return to a dynamic she shared with Mr. Reed before the assaults. She had planned to pitch her songs to Mr. Reed as possible materials for the artist on his label. Instead of listening to the CD that she handed him to play, Mr. Reed insisted that she stand up and sing for him when he realized the vocal on the CDs were hers. The armor of her MBA and her status as a married woman and a mom disintegrated as the crass feeling of being objectified by Mr. Reed returned. No amount of time, education, marital status, or additional hit records would undo the harm of the assaults. The effects are ongoing. In 2017, Ms. Dixon met with Ella Wilde, a young singer-songwriter whose music inspired Ms. Dixon to create her own record label, The Ninth Floor, named after the floor of that label, where she worked so productively with Clive Davis. Ella, who is now a freshman at the Clive David Institute of Recorded Music at NYU, is continuing to work with Ms. Dixon on new music. However, on at least one occasion, Ms. Dixon's attempts to secure a record deal for Ella were hampered by one of Mr. Reed's allies in the industry, who appeared to love Ella mu Ella's music before becoming aware of Ms. Dixon's history with Mr. Reed, at which point communication abruptly stopped. 
Even now, decades later, Mr. Reed is punishing Ms. Dixon for having to refuse to his demands. Going public. When Ms. Dixon began to tell her story publicly in 2017, she felt liberated, like a weight was lifted from her shoulders. 2017 was... So this is a little different than Cassie, because Cassie was actually an artist. But she, you know, now that she's not an artist, Cassie can move away from the lifestyle. This lady is actually involved in every aspect of music except being the artist. So she still needs, she still needs to um, work or, you know, she has to go through the gatekeepers like Diddy, like L.A. Reid, not so much Russell Simmons. Um, what does this have to do with Jay-Z? I, I, I don't know. Maybe you're talking to somebody in the comments. I don't know. Uh, I think you must be talking to somebody in the comments because I don't think that I mentioned Jay-Z. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, 2017 was a year of reckoning for abusers and harassers whose power and wealth had previously shielded them from accountability. The Me Too movement had exploded into a global phenomenon and seemingly untouchable people in power suddenly found their past actions kept seeing up with them. In May 2017, Sony and Epic Records parted ways with Mr. Reed after an assistant at Epic Records accused him of misconduct. They tried to say that he was moving on to, you know, greener pastures or better things. But in November 2017, Russell Simmons and filmmaker Brett Ratner were accused of teaming up to engage in misconduct against model Carrie Clausen Kali. In November 2017, the award-winning screenwriter Jenny Lumbett published a first personal account in The Hollywood Reporter of being violated in 1991 by Russell Simmons, the king of hip-hop and co-founder of Jeff Down Records, a contemporary of Mr. Reed. It was a watershed moment for Ms. Dixon, bringing to the fore a bundle of memories that she had worked hard to bury. Ms. Dixon appreciated that Ms. Lumbett's decision to speak out against Mr. Simmons must have been an excruciating one. On December 13, 2017, the New York Times published its article on Mr. Simmons. In the article, Ms. Dixon told her account of how Mr. Simmons harassed her, assaulted her, and violently R-worded her. The article also briefly mentioned that Mr. Reed had harassed Ms. Dixon. Although she revealed the assault in the car to the reporters at the New York Times, she never publicly discussed Mr. Reed's assault of her. In addition to Ms. Dixon and the Epic Records assistant, it is believed that Mr. Reed and her previously em previous employer quietly settled a handful of harassment complaints brought by female employees over more than a five-year stretch. Once Mr. Reed's actions began to receive more publicity, some artists that were involved with him voiced their opinions. In an interview in 2017, TLC was asked about the allegations against Mr. Reed, excuse me, who oversaw much of the group's early career. Chili buried her face in her hands. Tion T. Boz Watkins said she was not surprised by the accusations. Joe Budden, a rapper who was signed to one of the labels Mr. Reed ran, called Mr. Reed a predator and called out others in the industry who allowed Mr. Reed to continue his actions with no consequences. The aftermath. After her experience with Mr. Reed, Ms. Dixon gave up her career, abandoning not only her passion, but her over a decade of hard work spent learning a craft, building a network, and securing rare expertise that is not easily transferable to other industries. Unable to bounce back from Mr. Reed's assaults, harassment, and his constant tethering of his advances to professional obstacles that he placed in Ms. Dixon's path. Ms. Dixon became depressed and dejected, ultimately abandoning her professional passion and expertise. She walked away from the decade she had devoted to refining her talent, which began with two internships right after college followed by another job working as a receptionist and then a job as a junior executive at a music publishing company and finally culminated with her A&R roles of Def Jam. Despite Ms. Dixon's hard work, her vast creative and professional relationships and the stellar reputation she had built, Mr. Reed made it impossible for Ms. Dixon to do her job as punishment for rejecting his advances. Y'all, all you gotta say is this man passed up on John Legend and Kanye West. What would that have done for the label? What would that have done for the label? Um, uh, Merit 007 Clark, thank you for the super chat. Uh, Merit says, Miss Dixon is responsible for the classic, you're all I need to get by with Mary J. Blige and Method Man. She had a huge impact on some of our classics. Who knows what she could have done if she was allowed to continue to drive. Thank you so much for the super chat. 
Um, let's see. As a result, Ms. Dixon not only lost her career footing, but she also lost faith in herself. Over time, these experiences of abuse have erased her legacy and significance as a young woman who anticipated and impacted the massive potential of hip hop. When Mr. Reed took over as the head, Ms. Dixon had tremendous momentum and a blindingly bright future, having dusted herself off following the events at Def Jam. Unfortunately, Ms. Dixon ended up losing everything she built because Reed suffocated her career as punishment for her refusal to have a relationship with him or allowing him to continue to assault her unfettered. Because Mr. Reed drove Miss Dixon out of the music industry, we lost the ear that heard Maria Maria as a demo and brought it into a Arista for Carlos Santana that My Love Is Your Love as a demo and brought it to into for Whitney Houston. So we kind of reviewed that, guys. Because of Mr. Reed, we lost the talent that spotted unknown artists Kanye West, John Legend, Toya, and Alice Smith. We lost the woman whose idea gave us hip-hop's greatest love song, The Method of Mary J. Blige, I'll Be There For You. You're all I need to get by. We lost the ear and passion for young women who signed Brand Nubian for their reunion album and co-executive produced the critically acclaimed Foundation album. We lost decades of Miss Dixon's output and touch. And she lost decades of earning power, growth, personal fulfillment, and professional achievement. Ms. Dixon went into a severe depression for a time. When she left the music industry, she continued therapy with various professionals to help her CPTSD. Also, Cassie is going through that. And other issues associated with the trauma of the assaults. These opportunities were not taken, were not, taken not only because the trauma Ms. Dixon suffered drove her away from her dreams, but because any comeback attempt inevitably comes into Mr. Reed's orbit. Ms. Dixon's losses are profound. Her lost profits from Ms. Producer Points alone are staggering. A profession that involved daily listening sessions for Ms. Dixon and late nights at studios all amounted to nothing. Not because of her lack of skill, drive, or talent, but because L.A. Reed saw her as nothing more than an object to be used for his gratification with no regard for her intellect, mental health, or immeasurable value she brought to the music industry and pop culture as a whole. In fact, Mr. Reed used Ms. Dixon's immense love for the industry and her loyalty to artists she signed against her, weaponizing her devotion to her career and her craft to exploit her body. Moreover, Mr. Reed's looming presence and power in the music industry affects Ms. Dixon in the present day. As she attempts to participate in new dimensions of the industry, such as the highly lucrative music royalty space, where her combination of a &R chops and Harvard MBA should make her a highly employable senior professional. Ms. Dixon has been told that although she is well-known, well-respected, and highly qualified, she is essentially blackballed because she has spoken out against Mr. Simmons and Mr. Reed. Thus, the harm is ongoing. So it kind of gets into the Survivors Act, um, which we have gone over. If you haven't seen, uh, I actually read all of... Cassie's complaint against Diddy. Uh, I will link that at the end of this video. Um, so it goes over that why she's able to now come forward and how and how much time she has to do it. Ms. Dixon repeats and realleges that the allegation stated above um, is as fully set forth within. Mr. Reed intentionally committed battery assault when he intentionally and forcibly touched and made bodily contact with Ms. Dixon by touching her beneath her clothes and subjecting her to digital, you know, without her consent on two occasions as described above. Mr. Reed's action constitute offenses as defined in New York Penal Article 130, including but not limited to aggravated abuse, criminal abuse, forcible touching, abuse, assault, misconduct, inasmuch as Mr. Reed intentionally and forcibly digitally and touched her intimate parts so guys it's definitely the year of everybody needs to pay the piper we kind of heard from kimora earlier this year she had had enough with russell things would be so different at home um, so children do need fathers, children do need mothers, it takes a village, I will say that. But they don't need someone who is narcissistic, emotionally not supportive, um, abusive, physical, mental, emotional, financial. That's what we're talking about right now. Financial abuse you tried to inflict upon my kids. You tried by you know withholding this some little $300 or $500 or even maybe more allowance. That don't work. And I know you're probably looking at me now, fool, 
watching this, I'm sure. Like, I, I'm not your friend. We're not friends. Like, the stuff that you've done to our family is just too much. Like, please just go in peace. Go and serve the Lord, whatever whatever Lord you serve. You know, that's funny because on the one hand, you have all this yogi preaching, this yogi karmic love. You know, I feel like that's an act. And then the, the real side, the real things come out and you're like super, you know, vindictive and mean and lying, lying, lying. So that was some of what Kamora Lee said in her live video. Kamora chose to expose Russell in the worst way. And she even said, you know, some of the stuff that she was hiding. We all know the allegations of when Russell got with Kamora. But it is very interesting that these heads of the companies, Diddy and had Kim Porter, Kim Porter, Kim Porter and Kamora were like this. And then there was Russell. All the time, these rich, powerful men are taking advantage of their artists. It's, and we now know that, or it's alleged that Diddy was actually putting his hands on them as well, in addition to the, you know, sexual abuse. It's a lot, y'all. It's a lot. So I'll probably try to deep dive. I know a lot of you guys who do watch me normally are like, where is the RHOP stuff? I'm going to do my best to come live tomorrow morning to do my RHOP. RHOP review. I'm going to try to get to all my Bravo shows, Married to Medicine, RHOP, Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. I'm going to try to do that. I'm going to give it my all to make sure that that happens. Uh, if you're new to the channel, definitely subscribe. We are this close to now 80,000 subscribers. Um, and like the video. Um, getting this stuff takes a little bit of research and you know a little bit of money but i'm here to let you guys know what is going on what is popping off and what the allegations are so that's what we do here if you are new to the channel uh yeah and definitely shout out to the impressive channel um she is the one who had the kimura lee simmons so as always what i do is um i'm gonna link her video with kimura lee simmons exposing russell in the description of this video so anyway uh guys i gotta go because again this was this was a lot so i will see you guys hopefully tomorrow morning for my real housewife of potomac review so have a good night y'all enjoy uh and it's been a hell of a day i still blame yo-yo and mr ray for getting me a little tipsy today but you know they 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 were a good time so if you ever see them you know <laughs> let them know that mem said that uh i enjoyed the time i gotta go y'all so see y'all later have a good night